near the end of the first circle sojourn, the ascending pilgrims first meet the instigators of rest of the primary order of supernity. These are the angels of paradise. Coming out to greet those who stand at the threshold of eternity and to complete the preparation for the trans, trans, transition slumber of the last resurrection. You are not really a child in paradise until you have traversed the inner circle and have experienced the resurrection of eternity from the terminal sleep of time. The perfected pilgrim, pilgrims begin this rest, go to sleep on the first circle of Havona, but they awaken on the shores of paradise. Of all who ascend to the eternal isle, only thus those who thus arrive are the children of eternity. The others go as visitors, as guests, without residential status. And now at the culmination of the Havona career, as you mortals go to sleep on the pilot world of the inner circle, you go not alone to your rest, as you did on the worlds of your origin. When you closed your eyes in the natural sleep of mortal death, nor as you did when you entered the long transit trance, preparatory for the journey to Havona. Now as you prepare for the attainment rest, there moves over by your side, your longtime associate of the first circle, the majestic complement of rest, who prepares to enter the rest as one with you, as the pledge of Havona that your transition is complete and that you await only the final touches of perfection. Your first transition was indeed death, the second an ideal sleep. And now the third metamorphosis is the true rest, the relaxation of the ages. And then if you'll turn to page 283, we'll see what happens when you wake up. Yes, we must read about the Paradise Companions. I'm over in it right there, I like that. Oh no, no, there's even, there's even, you've merely heard, you've merely heard the end of the time-space movement. Now you've got to listen to the open, opening orchestrations of the eternity movement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this thing never ends on a finished note. Wait until I read you the last sentence in the story of the Paradise Ascent. The Paradise Companions are a compositor assembled group of rec recruited from the ranks of the Seraphim, Sikhanaphim, Supernaphim, and Omnivim. Though serving for what you would regard as an extraordinary length of time, they are not a permanent status on Paradise. When this ministry has been completed, as a rule, but not invariably, they return to those duties they performed when summoned to Paradise service. These selected angels are dedicated to the service of companionship and are assigned as associates to all classes of beings who may chance to be alone on paradise, chiefly to the ascendant mortals, but also to all others who are alone on the central isle. Paradise companions have nothing special to accomplish in behalf of those with whom they fraternize. They are simply companions. <coughs> Almost every other being you mortals will encounter during your paradise sojourn, aside from your fellow pilgrims, will have something definite to do with you or for you. But these companions are assigned only to be with you and to commune with you as personality associates. They are often assisted in their ministries, ministry by the gracious and brilliant paradise citizens. Mortals come from races that are very social. The creators well know that it is not good for man to be alone and provision is accordingly made for companionship even on paradise. If you as an ascendant mortal should reach paradise in the company of the companion or close associate of your earthly career, 
or if your seraphic guardian of destiny should chance to arrive with you or were waiting for you, then no permanent companion would be assigned you. But if you arrive alone, a companion will certainly welcome you as you awaken on the Isle of Light from the terminal sleep of time. Even if it is known that you will be accompanied by someone of Ascendant Association, temporary companions will be designated to welcome you to the eternal shores and to escort you to the reservation made ready for the reception of you and your associates. You may be certain of being warmly welcomed when you experience the resurrection into eternity on the everlasting shores of paradise. Reception companions are assigned during the terminal days of the ascender's sojourn on the last circuit of Havona, and they carefully examine the records of mortal origin and eventful ascent through the worlds of space and the circles of Havona. When they greet the mortals of time, they are, are, are already well versed in the careers of these arriving pilgrims and immediately prove to be sympathetic and intriguing companions. When once assigned to an ascendant mortal of solitary residence on paradise, the companion remains with this person until he either is rejoined by his ascendant associates or is duly mustered into the core of the finality. So now let's read about the primary support thing. These are the last of the ministering spirits and the highest. You'll recall they're created by the infinite spirit. And they're just completely interchangeable. They have these functions, but they're not limited by nature. Any primary support of him can do any job equally well. They're of a little interest to us, too, because the command, the seraphic commander on this planet, the chief of seraphim, is a volunteer primary supernophim from paradise. And she serves as the prime minister of the resident governor general. Page 298. These supernophim are the supernal servants of the deities on the eternal isle of paradise. Never have they been known to depart from the paths of light and righteousness. The roll calls are complete. From eternity, not one of this magnificent host has been lost. These high supernophim are perfect beings, supreme in perfection, but they are not absinite, neither are they absolute. Being of the essence of perfection, these children of the infinite spirit work interchangeably and at will in all phases of their manifold duties. And then, as we go on, not until the ascending pilgrims actually attain paradise residence do they come under the direct influence of these supernophim. And then they pass through a training experience under, under the direction of these angels in the reverse order of their naming. That is, you enter upon your paradise career under the tutelage of the instigators of rest, and after successive seasons with the intervening orders, the masters of chiefs of assignment, the interpreters of ethics, the directors of conduct, the custodians of knowledge, the masters of philosophy. Then you finish this training period with the conductors of worship. Thereupon are you ready to begin the endless career of a finaliter. The instigators of rest are the inspectors of paradise who go forth from the central isle to the inner circuit of Havona. They are to collaborate with their colleagues, the complements of rest, the secondary order of supernophim. The one essential to the enjoyment of paradise is rest, divine rest. And these instigators of rest are the final instructors who make ready the pilgrims of time for their introduction to eternity. They begin their work on the final attainment circle of the central universe and continue it when the pilgrim awakes from the last transition sleep, the slumber which graduates a creature of space into the realm of the eternal. You enter the rest on the final Havona circuit and are eternally resurrected on paradise. And as you there spiritually repersonalize, you will immediately recognize the instigator of rest who welcomes you to the eternal shores as the very primary supernatum who produced the final sleep on the innermost circuit of Havona. And you will recall the last grand stretch of faith as you once again made ready to commend the keeping of your identity into the hands of the Universal Father. The last rest of time has been enjoyed, 
the last transition sleep has been experienced. Now you awake to life everlasting on the shores of the eternal abode, and there shall be no more sleep. The presence of God and His Son are before you, and you are eternally His servants. You have seen His face, and His name is your spirit. There shall be no night there, and they need no light of the sun, for the great source and center gives them light. They shall live forever and ever, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. The angels of assignment have much to do with glorified mortal residents of paradise before they are admitted to the core of the finality. Study and instruction are not the exclusive occupation of paradise arrivals. Service also plays its essential part in the pre-finaliter educational experiences of paradise. And I have observed that when the ascendant mortals have periods of leisure, they evince a predilection to fraternize with the reserve core of the superaffic chiefs of assignment. When you mortal ascenders attain paradise, your societal relationships involve a great deal more than contact with a host of exalted and divine beings and with a familiar multitude of glorified fellow mortals. You must also fraternize with upwards of 3,000 different orders of paradise citizens with various groups of the transcendentalers that's the first mention of the second floor of the firehouse and with numerous other types of paradise inhabitants permanent and transient who have not been revealed on your ancient after sustained contact with these mighty intellects of paradise it is very restful to visit with the angelic types of mind they remind mortals of they remind the mortals of time of the seraphim with whom they have had such long contact and such refreshing association. Let's think how far we've come. When a seraphim who seems so foreign, when a supernophim who seems so foreign to us now will seem refreshingly familiar. Think of the people that we're dealing with for the first time. The higher you ascend in the scale of life, the more attention must be paid to universe ethics. Ethical awareness is simply the recognition by any individual of the rights inherent in the existence of any and all other individuals. But spiritual ethics far transcends the mortal and even the Marantia concept of personal and group relations. Ethics has been duly taught and adequately learned by the pilgrims of time in their long ascent to the glories of paradise. As this inward ascending career has unfolded from the nativity worlds of space, the ascenders have continued to add group after group to their ever-widening circle of universe associates. Every new group of colleagues met adds one more level of ethics to be recognized and complied with, until by the time the mortals of ascent reach paradise, they really need someone to provide helpful and friendly counsel regarding ethical interpretations. They do not need to be taught ethics but they do need to have what they have so laboriously learned properly interpreted to them as they are brought face to face with the extraordinary task of contacting with so much that is new. The interpreters of ethics are of inestimable assistance to the paradise arrivals in helping them to adjust to numerous groups of majestic beings during that eventful period extending from the attainment of residential status to formal induction into the core of mortal finalities. Many of the numerous types of paradise citizens, the ascendant being pilgrims, have already met on the seven circuits of Avona. The glorified mortals have also enjoyed intimate contact with the creature crinitized sons of the conjoint core on the inner Havona circuit, where these beings are receiving much of their education. And on the other circuits, the ascending pilgrims have met numerous unrevealed residents of the paradise Havona system who are there pursuing group training in preparation for the unrevealed assignments of the future. All these celestial companionships are invariably mutual. As ascending mortals, you not only derive benefit from these successive universe companions and such numerous orders of increasingly divine associates, but you also impart to each of these fraternal beings something from your own personality and experience, which forever makes every one of them different and better for having been associated with an ascending mortal from the evolutionary worlds of time and space.
Having already been fully instructed in the ethics of paradise relationships, neither meaningless formalities nor the dictations of artificial castes, but rather the inherent proprieties, the ascendant mortals find it helpful to receive the counsel of the superaffic directors of conduct who instruct new members of paradise society in the uses of the perfect conduct of the high beings who sojourn on the central isle of light. These are Emily Posts. They, they, they tell you now, in this particular gathering, you're going to see some forks that you've never saw, seen before, and here's how they function. Here's how you greet this type of being whom you've never met before. This is, this is the custom. But I'll bet you, as we think about the custom, they make exquisite sense to us. I don't think we'll rebel against these formalities, because these are not really formalities. These are the best ways of doing things. Harmony is the keynote of the central universe, and detectable order prevails on paradise. Proper conduct is essential to progress by way of knowledge through philosophy to the spiritual heights of spontaneous worship. There is a divine technique in the approach to divinity, and the acquirement of this technique must await the pilgrim's arrival on paradise. The spirit of it has been imparted on the circles of Avona, but the final touches of the training of the pilgrims of time can be applied only after they actually attain the Isle of Light. All paradise conduct is wholly spontaneous and in every sense natural and free, but there still is a proper and perfect way of doing things on the eternal Isle, and the directors of conduct are ever by the side of the strangers within the gate to instruct them and so guide their steps as to put them at perfect ease and at the same time to enable the pilgrims to avoid that confusion and uncertainty which otherwise would be inevitable. Only by such an arrangement could endless confusion be avoided, and confusion never appears on paradise. These directors of conduct really serve as glorified teachers and guides. They are chiefly concerned with instructing the new mortal residents regarding the almost endless array of new situations and unfamiliar usages. Notwithstanding all the long preparation therefore and the long journey thereto, Paradise is still inexpressibly strange and unexpectedly new to those who finally attain residential status. The superaffic custodians of knowledge are the higher living epistles known and read by all who live on paradise. They are the divine records of truth, the living books of real knowledge. You have heard about records in the book of life. The custodians of knowledge are just such living books records of perfection imprinted upon the eternal tablets of divine life and supreme surety. They are in reality living automatic libraries. The facts of the universe are inherent in these primary supernatives, actually recorded in these angels. It is also inherently impossible for an untruth to gain lodgment in the minds of these perfect and replete repositories of the truth of eternity and the intelligence of time. They conduct formal courses. You don't have to read pages anymore. When you locate that supernatural who is exactly what you desire to verify, you will find available all the known facts of all universes. For these custodians of knowledge are the final and living summaries of the vast network of the recording angels, ranging from the seraphim and seconophim of the local and super universes to the chief recorders of the tertiary supernatural in Havona. The wisdom of truth takes origin in the divinity of the central universe. But knowledge, experimental knowledge, largely has its beginnings in the domains of time and space. Therefore, the necessity for the maintenance of the far-flung super-universe organization of the recording seraphim and supernatim, sponsored by the celestial recorders. These primary supernatim, who are inherently in possession of universe knowledge, are also responsible for its organization and classification. In constituting themselves the living le reference library of the universe of universes, they have classified knowledge in, into seven grand orders, each having about one million subdivisions. The facility with which the residents of paradise can consult this vast store of knowledge 
is solely due to the voluntary and wise efforts of the custodians of knowledge. Next to the supreme satisfaction of worship is the exhilaration of philosophy. Never do you climb so high or advance so far that there do not remain a thousand mysteries which demand the employment of philosophy in an attempted solution. The master philosophers of paradise delight to lead the minds of its inhabitants, both native and ascendant, in the exhilarating pursuit of attempting to solve universe problems. These superaphic masters of philosophy are the wise men of heaven, the beings of wisdom, who make use of the truth of knowledge and the facts of experience in their efforts to master the unknown. With them, knowledge attains to truth and experience ascends to wisdom. On paradise, the ascendant personalities of space experience the heights of being. They have knowledge. They know the truth. They may philosophize, think the truth. They may even seek to encompass the concepts of the ultimate and attempt to grasp the techniques of the absolute. These paradise philosophers teach by every possible method of instruction, including the higher graph technique of Pavona and certain paradise methods of communicating information. All of these higher techniques of imparting knowledge and conveying ideas are utterly beyond the comprehension capacity of even the most highly developed human mind. One hour's instruction on paradise would be the equivalent of 10,000 years of the word memory methods of Urantia. You cannot grasp such communication techniques, and there is simply nothing in mortal experience with which they may be compared, nothing to which they can be likened. The masters of philosophy take supreme pleasure in imparting their interpretation of the universe of universes to those beings who have ascended from the worlds of space. And while philosophy can never be as settled in its conclusions as the facts of knowledge and the truths of experience, yet, when you have listened to these primary supernifim discourse upon the unsolved problems of eternity and the performances of the absolutes, you will feel a certain and lasting satisfaction concerning these unmastered questions. <coughs> these intellectual pursuits of paradise are not broadcast. The philosophy of perfection is available only to those who are personally present. The encircling creations know of these teachings only from those who have passed through this experience and who have subsequently carried this wisdom out into the universes of space. Worship is the highest privilege and the first duty of all created intelligence. Worship is the conscious and joyous act of recognizing and acknowledging the truth of fact and of the intimate and personal relationships of the creators with their creatures. The quality of worship is determined by the depth of creature perception, and as the knowledge of the infinite character of the gods progresses, the act of worship becomes increasingly all-encompassing until it eventually attains the glory of the highest experiential delight and the most exquisite pleasure known to created beings. While the Isle of Paradise contains certain places of worship, it is more nearly one vast sanctuary of divine service. Worship is the first and dominant passion of all who climb to its blissful shores, the spontaneous ebullition, ebullition of beings who have learned enough of God to attain his presence. Circle by circle during the inward journey through Havona, worship is a growing passion until on paradise it becomes necessary to direct and otherwise control its expression. How different from Sunday morning here. <laughs> the periodic spontaneous group and other special outbursts of supreme adoration and spiritual praise enjoined on paradise, enjoyed on paradise, are conducted under the leadership of a special corps of primary supernatural. Under the direction of these conductors of worship, such homage achieves the creature goal of supreme pleasure and attains the heights of the perfection of sublime self-expression and personal enjoyment. All primary supernatim crave to be conductors of worship, and all ascendant beings would enjoy forever remaining in the attitude of worship, did not the chiefs of assignment periodically disperse these assemblages. 
But no ascendant being is ever required to enter upon the assignments of eternal service until he has attained full satisfaction in worship. Just think, breaking up a prayer meeting is going on too long. It is the task of the conductors of worship so to teach the ascendant preachers how to worship that they may be enabled to gain this satisfaction of self-expression and at the same time be able to give attention to the essential activities of the paradise regime. Without improvement in the technique of worship, it would require hundreds of years for the average mortal who reaches paradise to give full and satisfactory expression to his emotions of intelligent appreciation and ascendant gratitude. The conductors of worship open up new and hitherto unknown avenues of expression so that these wonderful children of the womb of space and the travail of time are enabled to gain the full satisfaction of worship in much less time. All the arts of all the beings of the entire universe which are capable of intensifying and exalting the abilities of self-expression and the conveyance of appreciation are employed to the, their highest capacity in the worship of the paradise deities. Worship is the highest joy of paradise existence. It is the refreshing play of paradise. What play does for your jaded minds on earth, worship will do for your perfected souls on paradise. The mode of worship on paradise is utterly beyond mortal comprehension, but the spirit of it you can begin to appreciate even down here on your rancher. For the spirits of the gods, even now, indwell you, hover over you, and inspire you to true worship. There are appointed times and places for worship on paradise, but these are not adequate to accommodate the ever-increasing overflow of the spiritual emotions, of the growing intelligence and expanding divinity recognition of the brilliant beings of experiential ascension to the eternal life. Never since the times of Grand Fanda have the Supernifim able, been able fully to accommodate the spirit of worship on paradise. Always is there an excess of worshipfulness as gauged for the preparation, therefore. And this is because personalities of inherent perfection can never fully appreciate the tremendous reactions of the spiritual emotions of beings who have slowly and laboriously made their way upward to paradise glory from the depths of the spiritual darkness of the lower worlds of time and space. When such angels and mortals of time attain the presence of the powers of paradise, there occurs an, expand, an expression of the accumulated emotions of the ages, a spectacle astounding to the angels of paradise and productive of the supreme joy of divine satisfaction in the paradise deities. Sometimes all paradise becomes engulfed in a dominating tide of spiritual and worshipful expression. Often the conductors of worship cannot control such phenomena until the appearance of the threefold fluctuation of the light of the deity abode, signifying that the divine heart of the gods has been fully and completely satisfied by the sincere worship of the residents of paradise. The perfect citizens of glory and the ascendant creatures of time. What a triumph of technique. What a fruition of the eternal plan and purpose of the gods that the intelligent love of the creature child should give full satisfaction to the infinite love of the Creator Father. After the attainment of the supreme satisfaction of the fullness of worship, you are qualified for admission to the core of the finality the ascendant career is well nigh finished, and the seventh jubilee prepares for celebration. The first jubilee marked the mortal agreement with the thought adjuster when the purpose to survive was sealed. The second was the awakening in the Marantia life. The third was the fusion with the thought adjuster. The fourth was the awakening in Havona. The fifth celebrated the finding of the Universal Father, and the sixth jubilee was the occasion of the Paradise Awakening from the final transit slumber of time. The seventh jubilee marks the entrance into the mortal finality core 
and the beginning of the eternity service. The attainment of the seventh stage of spirit realization by a finality will probably signalize the celebration of the first of the jubilees of eternity. And thus ends the story of the Paradise Supernifim, the highest order of all the ministering spirits, those beings who, as a universal class, ever attend you from, your, from the world of your origin until you are finally bidden farewell by the conductors of worship as you take the Trinity Oath of Eternity and are mustered into the mortal core of the finality. The endless service of the Paradise Trinity is about to begin, and now the finality is face to face with a challenge of God the Ultimate. Wouldn't you know it would end that way? You've just finished the greatest thing that could happen to a human being. And you suddenly discover that the ceiling of the first floor of the firehouse is also the floor of the second floor of the firehouse. You've encountered a new challenge. Let's derive a planet and, and achieve destiny, shall we? The, we won't go into outer space, we'll go into Orvantan space. While this is going on in outer space, the story, I believe, starts just the same as ours, because apparently those nebulae out there are just like the nebulae in Orvantan. But about halfway through the story, it's different. About halfway through our story, we're going to get universe power directors coming in. And this won't be true in the first outer space level. The associate transcendental master force organizers will continue right on in charge of that physical creation. So, as we tell this story, up until the time the power centers of Arvantan take over, I believe the story in Norvantan and the story in the first and even the second outer space level runs parallel. But from that up point on, they diverge. And this raises an interesting question about the difference between Norvantan and the first outer space level. I believe that that first outer space level is going to be ex extraordinarily old when we invade it. And it seems to me that it might be possible that it would be physically stabilized before life is ever implanted out there. So that there would be no more astronomical collisions, accidents, and whatnot. In other words, they would have really set the thing up physically before they ever went into it with life and mind and spirit. That's my speculation. You will find, you will find no support for that in the papers. Why wouldn't they have done that in our case then? Because this was the first one, and they wanted to get going, right? Now they're working on this one, which gives them this fabulous amount of time to get that one set up. The only thing before us was Helvona, which was always there. That's why this, the, that's why the super universe space level is going to be different from anything before or anything which comes after. It's it, yes, it will be different from the first, from the four outer space levels in a way that they will not differ from each other, I don't think. I think in the four outer space levels, the differences are more quantitative, whereas here, the difference between us and Avona or us and them is essentially qualitative. I think the four outer space levels are far more akin to each other than we are to them or Havona, or, or than Havona is to them. And that's because the God the ultimate is evolving all, all through these four outer space levels. Nothing ends when a, an outer space level ends in the sense that the supreme being ends when we are completed. In a sense, now here's where our firehouse breaks down a little bit. In a sense, the super universe space level is the first floor of the firehouse. And the four outer space levels are the second floor. 
you should ask me then, where is Havona? Havona is on all of these floors. Havona is finite. Havona is absinite. Havona is at least co-absolute. But paradise would only be on one floor. Paradise isn't in the firehouse. Paradise is the foundation on which the firehouse is built. And paradise is also the hypothetical roof of the third floor. Paradise is both alpha and omega in relation to the firehouse. Full circle. Yes. If they could reach the roof of the third floor, they would have attained an experiential paradise value. And I know that the firehouse is built on paradise. Paradise is the foundation of the firehouse. Paradise is before the firehouse and after the firehouse. It is below and above. But before and after is a better word than below and above. I'm going to do some speculating. I'm going to do some guessing. I'm going to tell a story which even the divine counselor won't tell because he knows more than I do. And if he tells it, he's guilty of evil. And I can tell it because I don't know any better. We will now proceed to unscrew the inscrutable. <laughs> but the papers encourage me to speculate, at the same time warning all of us that our speculations are going to be false. They tell us that our universe romance, romancings are seldom factual, but even so they may contain much that's truth. This encourages me to have courage along with humility. I think the third source and center has to do with prying loose from the unqualified absolute his grasp on space potency. I think this is a transaction having its roots way back in the deities of paradise. We are told that the third person of deity, not as the infinite spirit, but as the infinite manipulator, does manipulate the forces of paradise. If he can operate on an absolute actuality, I believe he can also operate on an absolute potentiality. This is the logical basis for my speculation. If we have to work out the mechanics of this, if it's not done directly by the infinite manipulator, then I believe it is done by him through the Paradise Trinity, activating the Deity Absolute, which would cause repercussions in the unqualified Absolute. We know that that relationship works because we are so told in the papers. When the Paradise Trinity takes snuff, the unqualified Absolute sneezes. Golly, I wonder how that sounds on you, person. <laughs> the, uh, I feel almost blasphemous sometimes in trying to get at these things, but I think if your intent is good, you could, you could call God anything and you wouldn't mind, you know? Sure. People are that way. Yes, Ruth? It's hard for me to see why that would be the sequence. That, you would be sequence. I'm trying to get at the unqualified absolute. No. I know I can approach him. I know I can approach it through the Paradise Trinity, functioning in an unlimited sense. Because the unlimited function of the Paradise Trinity is the function of the Deity Absolute at the present, in the, at the present time. And if the Deity Absolute functions, this affects the unqualified Absolute because they are united in the Universal Absolute. Now whether it goes this route, or whether the third person, as the infinite manipulator, operates directly I don't know. I think it could be either. I prefer the direct theory. It seems simpler to me. And I think if the conjoint actor, who is the god of action, if he can do things which affect paradise and its functions, then I think he can do things which affect the unqualified absolute and its functions. I believe that the original prying loose of some space potency from the grasp of the unqualified absolute 
is the function of the conjoint actor. The papers say that if he initiates the motions of space, they can't prove it. But they believe he is the ancestor of motion in space. He's the god of action. And this is action. This is initial creativity. And he personified in conjunction with the original creativity of Ona. I think ever since then, he has been initiating. Only the difference is in Havona he also consummated. He still initiates, but his deputies and God's deputies now consummate. I think that through the architects of the Master Universe, the conjoint actor makes known this action. And I think the appropriate architects the architect in charge of Orvantan would then dispatch primary force organizers direct from paradise. And I don't think the ancients of days know anything about this. And I don't think the Council of Equilibrium up on Uversa knows anything about this. This is a transaction at the near paradise level of reality. I think the architects of the Master Universe know all about this. I think these primary Master Force organizers come out here and their presence signifies that the conjoint creator has already done this. When they arrive, their presence completes the segregation of this quantity, volume, or measure of space potency within the unsegregated remainder of space potency. This space potency came from paradise at the dawn of eternity. It is of paradise origin. The unqualified absolute has been its custodian ever since this eternity event. When the unqualified absolute is the sole custodian of this nebulous stuff of the universes to be, it is called absoluta, or space potency. When the conjoint actor does that, initiates that, which is then completed on the second stage by the primary master force organizers, it is no longer unsegregated. It is segregated from a larger whole, and it's called segregata, or primordial energy. Now these primary force organizers do not have to work in the totality or wholeness of the unqualified absolute. They have now got a chunk that they can go to work on. They have framed something within which they can work and without which outside of which they're not going to work. The beginning of anything requires a frame, be it the frame of a concept, the, 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 the pattern of a spirit, or the segregation of some space potency from all other space potency. These primary force organizers up until now have done this by their passive presence. I think the real action took place by paradise deity, by the conjoint actor. But now that they have got segregata, now I think they're on their own. And I think they go actively to work on this segregata to transform it into the first form of puissant, of the first form of emergent energy. Let me get my terminology cold here. This segregator is, is synonymous with primordial force. Primordial means there is nothing before this. But of course there is one thing before this, but it's not, it's not anything that anybody can operate on. Primordial force is the first form of force which is manipulatable this side of deity.
and the manifestation of greatness on a world like Urantia is the exhibition of self-control. The great man is not he who takes a city or overthrows a nation, but rather he who subdues his own tongue.